This is TTT Live. I'm Mahalia Joseph Wharton. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT Talk City 91.1 FM and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. Good morning and thank you for joining us for another Ministry of Health virtual media conference. These media conferences are intended for you, the public, to hear directly from the medical subject matter experts themselves. We remain committed to providing you with relevant, accurate, and up-to-date information on the national COVID-19 response. Our panelists today are the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Roshan Parashram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health, and Dr. Miriam Richards, Principal Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health. We also have Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director, Epidemiology Division, Ministry of Health. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health and your moderator for this morning's program. We begin with Dr. Richards, who will present the clinical update, the update on re re the repatriations and the parallel healthcare system. Dr. Richards. Good morning to all. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Dial Singh, our Chief Medical Officer, and of course my colleague, Dr. Hines. Uh, good morning to members of the media, the viewing and listening public, and good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. This morning, I come to you to provide an update on the status of the parallel healthcare system. This would involve the clinical update as per media release 719 4 p.m on may 9th 2021 as well as the status of our hospital occupancy levels in trinidad and tobago and just a brief update on the repatriation process as of 4 p.m on the 9th of may 2021 there were 233 cases of covid 19 that have been confirmed this brings the total active positive cases to 3,907, which is distributed as follows. 233 new cases, 408 persons at the state and state quarantine facilities, and 3,278 persons in home isolation, as well as 54 persons distributed in three step-down facilities. These step-down facilities are the Claxton Bay Correctional Facility, which has seven persons, the UE Debe facility with 27, and at Tobago step-down, there are 20 confirmed COVID-positive patients. At current in our hospitals, there are 342 patients. The Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility has a total of 141 patients, of which 15 are ICU level and 56 were high dependency unit level. The Cora Hospital has a total of 86 patients, the Augustus Long Hospital of 48, 48 patients, the Arima General Hospital at 39 patients, Scarborough Regional Hospital 26, and Scarborough General Hospital to ICU patients. Now I'd like to stress to the population that at this point in time, we need to look at the overall capacity of the hospitals because the hospital system really uh, consists of the major limiting factor in our fight against COVID-19. Over the weekend, the Ministry of Health, in conjunction with the regional health authorities, attempted to increase, and we did it successfully, the overall capacity of our hospitals. Now again, I would like to reiterate to the population that this issue is one of supply and demand. There has been an increasing number of cases. Our rolling average is close to 300 for the past seven days, and we find that if there are increasing cases, there would be an increased number of hospital admissions. We have found that approximately 15 persons of every 100 confirmed cases 
can act, uh, require hospitalization. And the level of hospital care that they require actually comes from the ward level patients. Now there are three levels of care. One is ward level where persons can walk around where they are continuously assessed by our nurses but they are more or less independent in terms of function and may require some low flow oxygen by face mask at times intermittently. These persons may have what we call coexisting medical conditions or unable to isolate at home. The next level would be the high dependency unit patients and these are patients who would require care that is inclusive of oxygen therapy and they require a more um, conservative effort from the nursing personnel so the ratio is different. Of course we have the ICU level which is a step up now where persons are unconscious and they are ventilated using a ventilator. And this is where persons are in what we would call as critical or severe condition. Now at present, our major need or the demand is in the ward level beds. And over the weekend, uh, the Ministry of Health successfully was able to actually implement and to increase the number of ward level beds. So we have designated a fourth level now of care, which is called a step down or a halfway house between persons uh, recovering from the hospital but who are not yet fit to go at, to go home. There are a few benefits of this new level of care. Firstly, persons um, are between the hospital in terms of the ward and at home. This means that they are allowed to really function a little bit more independently. Um, their level of care may be less, but they are still being observed by on-call physicians who are on-site and nurses. And it prepares them mentally at this point in time to really have um, an increased um, sort of, you know, in terms of their mental health and otherwise. Secondly, it allows the freeing up of spaces in the continued facilities. So it means that persons are able to move into new facilities, um, which are the secondary and tertiary care facilities. We have increased the number of beds over the weekend by 90, and they are as follows. At the Davis Sebdon facility, 50 beds were increased, right? At the UTT Valsane facility, there were 20 additional beds and at the point 14 facility another 40. I'm sorry the number should have been 110 my error. <laughs> this brings the number of ward level beds to 572 and the overall capacity of the parallel healthcare system to 662. Just to give you an example of how this works, this morning the Coover hospital was at 86 percent. Thus far for the morning we have been able to decant or to step down 12 persons and we expect to have a total of 20 persons step down. So by this afternoon we would have an occupancy at the coop at the at, at the core hospital of 66 percent uh, which of course allows for the admission of persons who need that level of care. Another benefit of this, um, in this, this next step down facility really would include better use of our staff which are required to be in the hospital. I'd like to reiterate to the population that increasing beds is not the answer to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are testing and exhibiting the resilience of the parallel healthcare system by converting step down facilities and quarantine facilities into an advanced, more advanced level of care to treat those patients who are ill and require continued management and follow up by nurses and doctors. However, we as a population need to continue to decrease the demand for hospital beds. And we, how do we do this? We need to continue to practice the public health interventions. That is the COVID-19 measures. We are asking you to wear your mask properly. We are asking you to watch your distance. Please avoid congregation, stay at home, avoid commingling. And we are asking you yet again to continue washing your hands and sanitize. As I close this morning, I would like to ask each and every one of you 
on behalf of the Ministry of Health, on behalf of every frontline staff that worked all day yesterday and have been working tirelessly for the past year and five months. Please stay at home. Please avoid mixing and commingling and congregating. This is the only way forward to reduce this burden on us. Thank you very much, and co let's continue to keep safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Dr. Hines will now provide the epidemiological update. Dr. Hines. Okay, thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Honorable Minister, to my colleagues, Dr. Parasram and Dr. Richards. I'm going to present the epidemiologic update and give a little bit of the background of what was also being done while these figures were being manifested. So if I can have my first slide. Here we are looking at that day-by-day -day epidemic curve, and this curve shows, as we've been saying, that upward trend of taller and taller bars uh, as we move from left to right looking at the period between March to April to May and seeing that in that time frame what we were seeing is increasing numbers represented by those increasing heights of bars and also represented by that dotted line which may be a little difficult to see but that upward trend of that dotted line which is the rolling average of new cases so we kept seeing more and more cases daily since around the end of March early April let's go to the next slide now two things are shown here we'll talk about the bars first again focusing on the week by week this uh this graph is a bar chart that shows week by week how many cases we would have confirmed and reported at the end of an epidemiologic week so the numbers that you see one two three four going all the way up to 19 for the year 2021 those were the weeks that began in January and moved all the way through to our current week. We're currently in week 19. And what we see is that from about week 10, where the numbers had been relatively low for a few weeks, we started to see an increase between week 10 and week 11. And then again between week 11 and week 12. And that really corresponded to that last week of March, 21st to 27th of March. And at that point, having seen that increase in two consecutive weeks we began to sound the alarm so to speak we began to make note of the fact that we've seen this upward trend whereas we've been seeing low numbers and we began also to warn the population about the risk of the spread of cases at that point we were seeing cases that were concentrated in county Kearney and county victoria the contact tracing at that point had shown some activities that had been advised against and but we understand that fatigue sometimes makes people do inadvisable things so we had seen the bar hopping and the uh, attendance at church when people were ill being part of the background of that contact tracing and of course transmission both in workplaces and in homes or households as we moved from week 12 to 13 to 14 with increasing numbers we also saw that the spread became more uh, more widely distributed across the country so around that time we started to see more cases going from St. George West to Central to East uh, that whole Western into East West Corridor uh, geographic area in addition to continuing cases in Kearney and Victoria and St. Patrick and as we moved from week 14 to 15 we continued to see even more spillover and spread into the eastern part of the country, the Sangre Grande, Valencia, uh, Rio Claro, Mayaro area. Uh, and the numbers from one week to the next continued to become higher and higher. But against this backdrop, there were also public health measures that were implemented, starting with limiting gatherings, closing beaches, uh, limiting the in-house dining so that you could only do takeaway. And then those measures became progressively more stringent as the numbers continued to rise. So against this backdrop, backdrop where we're seeing higher bars and implementing additional and, and more stringent measures, we are now at week 19, which is that short bar at the end. We've just had one day of week 19 so far, but what we've seen is that each week 
17, 18 has gone progressively higher and we're hoping that at this point during the course of week 19 some of those measures that we've been implementing begin to bear fruit and that we see at the end of this week a uh, change in the trend. We can only uh, we can only report on that when the week is finished and uh, we see what has actually come out of the system. Next slide. Looking at the numbers by month because it's a little easier to understand months, calendar months for most people, and focusing on the more colorful end of this graph, the right hand side, we see January in green, February in blue, March in orange, and then that big jump between March and April, where March had 313 cases, April had 2,798. That's over the 30 days of April. Bear in mind that we are now reporting data up to the 9th of May, just a week and two days into May, and we've already nearly reached the total for the entire month of April, showing that that increase in speed uh, continued from April into May so far. So we do expect that May will exceed April. We're hoping that the breaking mechanisms that we've put into place will uh, diminish the amount by which, they, by which it manages to exceed April, however. And behind that, the backdrop is that we're seeing an increase in the positivity, meaning the percentage of swabs that we do that come back positive for COVID-19, now reaching around 37%. Next slide. Now, the male-female distribution and the age group distribution remains largely as it has been throughout the pandemic, with the majority of the cases being in that moving working age group 25 to 49, and a slight preponderance or a slight, uh, in a slight majority of men over women. Next slide. What we do note though is that in the deaths, especially in the more recent times, we have seen a little bit of a change where, whereas we would have had maybe 75% uh, of the deaths being male and 25% being female, we're seeing where that percentage of females among the deaths has increased and we're also seeing where Whereas we would have seen deaths in the 60 and above age group accounting for about 70% of all deaths, it now only accounts for about 65 or 66% as there have been more deaths in that younger age group, the, the age group under 60. Next slide, please. We see that the geographic distribution is, as we've been speaking about, anywhere that there are population centers and urban centers, you're seeing those dark red uh, colorations for the communities. And the important thing to note here is not just the coloration, but if you look at the legend, the little boxes on the right that say what the colors mean, we're now seeing that the darkest colors represent more than 50 cases in a community, whereas before they would have been 11 or 12, then 20 or 30. The numbers continue to increase in the, po in the various community pockets. Next slide, please. The projections that we've been talking about, looking at these blue bars as the daily reported cumulative cases and the lines extending beyond the bars as the direction in which we're seeing that it may go, we're still seeing where we are on that same track. We're hoping that we begin to see some breaking, some deviation from the track uh, to the point where the blue bars start falling below that green line. But so far, we are basically on track with, at the same speed as we have projected since about the end of April. And next slide. That means that the active cases, as we've been seeing them, continue along their track of uh, rapid increase. And out of the active cases, we will continue to see hospitalization. So this green line that's curving upwards has continued along its projected track following those yellow dots that extend beyond them. And at the bottom of that, we also see the new cases versus the projected new cases. So the real new cases versus the projected ones. And if we go to the next slide, we see that a little better, where we're actually seeing again that the new cases being the bars in orange and that green overlay saying what we kind of projected on a day-to-day -day basis. We are, over the last few days, starting to see a little bit of uh, deviation, a uh, little bit of are uh, slowing in terms of numbers, but that is that is could possibly be as a result of just daily fluctuations. So we're not we're not claiming success there yet, but we are monitoring. However, we do also see that with that purple line showing the total hospitalized, uh, that line has begun to flatten a little bit, really as a result of the activities that Dr. Richards had just have spoken about, where we're decanting from the hospital hospital system to a step-down facility in order to make some space. Now, that again, 
is not the be all and end all of the response. We do need to get the new cases to come down so that this projected line doesn't get us to the uh, to the end of our hospital capacity in the next few days. And I believe that's the end of my slides and I'm going to return you to Mr. Alexander for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. I now hand you over to the CMO who will present information on vaccines. Hi, good morning to the Honorable Minister. Morning to Dr. Richards, to Dr. Hines, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So kicking off where Dr. Hines would have left out, how do we get the population levels down in terms of the number of cases? One of the greatest public health um, tools we have in our armory um, is really vaccines. So if we could have my first slide, what I want to focus a little bit on today, and I had done it a couple of months ago, is what are vaccines, how they're developed, what is going on with the COVAX facility, and, and a little bit of real-world evidence of how this vaccine has worked against COVID-19. So a vaccine, just to restate, is a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity to a specific disease, thereby protecting the person from that disease. The, what we anticipate and what we have seen with COVID-19 vaccines, for example, the AstraZeneca, is that we have to have two doses given at a, at a period apart, in this case 8 to 12 weeks, and after that we wait an additional two weeks to receive what we call maximum immunity based on the studies that are conducted for that particular vaccine. So if we go to the second slide, so vaccination is supposed to actually create an immune response within your body and vaccination as a process is the act of introducing a vaccine into the body to produce immunity to a specific disease. Immunization is a process by which a person becomes protected against a disease through vaccination. So when we speak about the different rates, um, for example 86%, 95%, we are speaking about rates of specific types of immune responses within the body that is expected to be produced by a vaccine and which is based on trial data to the most part, some phase 4 trial data as well. Next slide. So again, history of the vaccines. First vaccine developed was of course the smallpox vaccine introduced by Edward Jenner in 1796, pertussis vaccine in 1914, diphtheria 1926, tetanus 1928, and the combination of DTP in 1948 and of course Vaccines considered con, um, continue to be generated, and the latest for EUL would be the COVID-19 list of vaccines. Next slide. Again, we see a slide on the left-hand side with a child with smallpox. Most of the physicians of this era would not have seen this disease, and the reason we didn't see this disease is because of the, the success of the vaccination programs. So smallpox would have been eradicated. There are 300 million people in the 20th century and 500 million people in the last 100 years would have had it. And with the introduction of the vaccine, the disease was able to be eradicated. And children don't have to actually get the shot anymore because of the eradication programs. So smallpox is now only a memory, and as I said, most of the physicians in this era would not have seen it. Next slide. So the role of vaccines, and vaccines again are the most important public health interventions in history, having led to the eradication of smallpox and led to significant reductions in incidence of many other viral and bacterial diseases. If uptake is great, can lead to the development of what we want in the country as herd immunity. Next slide. So vaccines, why do we need to vaccinate? Vaccines prevent diseases which have not disappeared. They keep you healthy. Vaccines are as important to your overall health as diet and exercise. Vaccinations can mean the difference between life and death, and vaccines are safe to use. Next slide. So vaccines won't, sorry, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, all right. So we go straight into the types of vaccines. And again, just to say, give some examples of the different types. So when we speak of virus vaccine generation, they have really four major platforms. Viral vector platform, of course, as we know, the vaccine we're using in Trinidad right now, AstraZeneca is an example of that. Nucleic acid type mRNA vaccines, for example, Pfizer and Moderna, protein-based vaccines. They don't have in approval stage as yet with WHO any proteinaceous um, of the COVID-19 vaccines. And of course, the last category, inactivated, and the newest addition to our armory, Sinopharm, will be from this particular category. Other vaccines is a very old platform. 
influenza, for example, is based on the inactivated vaccine platform as well. Next slide. So speaking about herd immunity in general, we, we, we had said over and again that we're looking at about 70% of the population in general, just bearing in mind that most of the COVID-19 vaccines are available to persons over 18, meaning that we already have a segment of the population who can't be vaccinated. Those in the orange, that, that orange group there, would be people under 18, the children, pregnant women, breastfeeding persons, persons who have severe allergic reactions to common components of the vaccine. All the rest of us, which are in blue, need to come forward and have the vaccine to pr protect those in orange. So that is what we do for herd immunity. When we do our calculations, again, we have a, approximately a million people who can take the vaccine, and we are asking everyone to come forward and have your COVID vaccine when it is available to you. Next slide. So impact of vaccines, I just used this slide to show what happened in the 1950 to 2007 with measles in particular. So you saw large numbers on the left hand side if you look at the axis, large numbers of cases occurring in a seesaw like pattern where you have the epidemic going down and up um, with public health measures I am and I, I would suggest. And just like we had in many parts of the world, you have waxing and waning of the trends and then the vaccine came on and about the, the mid between 1960 and 70 and you're seeing a precipitous drop and then thereafter it tables off and today we continue our vaccination of measles as an MMR vaccine in our expanded program of immunization program. Just to stay on this slide for a little bit and, and um, picture what is happening in the UK for example. The UK has 60 million people and as we have been looked, looking on with the UK in terms of their infections over the COVID-19 epidemic we see that their cases have gone significantly down since the introduction of their vaccines. I believe they, they had started the vaccination in the UK on the 8th of December 2020. And what we are seeing now in March is that their, their cases have gone considerably down. They were able to vaccinate approximately 121,000 persons per day um, at this point in time. And even at their peak, they were able to vaccinate close to 500,000 people per day in the UK which is an astounding number and what it led to is a considerable reduction in the number of cases that they are seeing. They actually are able at this point 67.1% of the adult population has one dose and 33.9% has two doses and we're seeing in a real world setting and UK is an example right around our corner St. Kitts is doing very well in terms of their program. Um, really seeing the, the benefit of vaccinating very quickly your population and getting that herd immunity there and we are seeing the drop in the number of cases and it's something we want to see happen in Trinidad and Tobago as well in the near future. Last slide. So just the smallpox vaccine again has led to just to sum up the pandemic which claimed the lives of over 3 million and we, we saw eradication of that disease and of course at the time that I did that slide and I let it up I left it in there the world anguish, ang anxiously awaited a vaccine at that time. That would have been earlier on in the year. And of course, as we know, the Pfizer vaccine was the first to be given WHO EUL on the 31st of December, AstraZeneca on the 15th of February, and it followed quickly with um, Johnson & Johnson, and of course now Sinopharm, the latest edition. And we really thank the WHO for, for getting that vaccine on the EUL list. Um, and as, as Minister may go into some detail, we're expecting it in the near future but it will really bring us in Trinidad and Tobago towards a point where we can get that vaccine out as quickly as we can. We are relying on the public to accept it and take it and get us towards herd immunity in addition to our pub public health measures. Thank you all. I think that's my end of my slides for this morning. Thank you very much, CMO, for that update. I now invite the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, to bring a wider context to this morning's update. Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, good morning to the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Richards, Dr. Hines, ladies and gentlemen of the media, members of the vegan listening public, wherever you are. Today is a sort of mixed bag for me. Good news, not so good news. I want to start off by thanking both the Trinidad Guardian and the Trinidad Express. Um, the Express for the editorial yesterday about closing ranks now. This was in the context 
of some dangerous statements being made by the opposition led by Kamala Prasad Bisesa and her chief vaccine spokesperson, Mr. Rudal Modilal. It is so regrettable that these were the same persons questioning me and the government where we getting vaccines from. Now that we are getting WHO approved vaccines in large quantities, it is the same opposition now that is stating, and I quote Mr. Munilal in today's papers, but we must be cautious as we go forward with the multiplicity of vaccines coming to our shores. We are going to have two vaccines. Is that a multiplicity of vaccines? Two WHO vaccines. The United States was vaccinated with three and four vaccines at the same time. Not WHO approved at the time. I am urging all parties to heed the words of the Sunday Express editorial yesterday. Close ranks now. Now is not the time for reckless opposition politics. Because in my view, they do not want the vaccination program to succeed because they have a political agenda. Provide leadership, please. I also want to recommend to the public to ignore the opposition led by the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisesa and her chief vaccine spokesman Rudy Mulalal when he talks about Chinese vaccines and Indian vaccines. I have said before, there is no such thing as a Chinese vaccine or an Indian vaccine. There are vaccines made in China, there are vaccines made in India, there are vaccines made in England, made in the United States, made in Italy, made in South Korea. But to put a racial connotation to vaccines and blow that silent dog whistle will do us no good. I am urging the opposition, led by Kamala Fassad Bissessa, the honorable member, to rein in her chief vaccine spokesperson. I also encourage Dr. Lakram Bodo and Dr. Rai Ragbir to now be the Elizabeth Cheney of the UNC and speak truth to power. Your silence can be interpreted as acquiescence and agreement. When you hang up your medical degrees on the walls of your offices, you have a larger public duty and your Hippocratic oath says, first do no harm. So I would like to hear the opinions of the two doctors mentioned, not by name, in the expressed editorial at the end. And let me just quote it. The editorial says, the opposition UNC has many well-respected medical professionals within its ranks, and we urge them to stop, step forward and provide a medical guidance to help save lives and protect the public's health in this terrible pandemic. My question to Dr. Lakram Bodo and Dr. Rai Ragbir, are you going to step up? Are you going to be the Elizabeth Cheney of the UNC? The next editorial I would like to address, and again thank them for, is today's editorial in The Guardian. The Alsing tears are no laughing matter. It says, he finds himself the butt of memes and public scorn, which I have no problem with. It comes with the territory. For telling the nation that he wept after observing a lack of adherence to the protocols that can save lives. We must sit up and wonder, and this is the crucial line, and I thank the Guardian for this. We must sit up and wonder if the heart of the nation is beating right. Is the heart of the nation beating right on this COVID issue? It goes on to say, as the man at the helm, this is understandably heartbreaking. 
Minister Dial Singh above all carries the burden of the health of the nation and every death ultimately is also a cross he must bear. But I don't bear it alone. Last night, when we were operationalizing the UTT campus that Dr. Richard spoke about, I spent Mother's Day morning with them there, and I went back last night. We got news last night around 9 o'clock, Dr. Dr. Richards was there together with Dr. Trotman and every, that a patient had just died in Cora. And the pall of gloom that came across all of us was palpable. Every death, the healthcare workers take this seriously, not only the Minister of Health. We feel saddened. And my tears pale in comparison to the tears of families that lose their loved ones. My tears pale in comparison to the family that lost two persons simultaneously. So the question is, is the heart of the nation beating right? The reason I ask this is because Dr. Hines, as you have heard, has been telling this country months now about the spread of the virus from County Victoria, from County Carney. Dr. Janine St. Bernard has been warning this country that this recent spike started in County Victoria. Change your ways, stop the bar hopping. It then, sorry, from County Carney. It then spread to County Victoria. We kept on talking to the population. We implemented rollback measures. On April 1st, we announced the rollback on recreational team sports. On April the 14th, public restrictions from uh, gardens from 10 to 15, in-house dining at restaurants, cinemas, casinos, and beaches. We were trying to dampen demand for bed space way before this current spike because we foresaw if the public continued to behave the way they were behaving, this would have been the end. Dr. Hines, warned this country. Mr. Roshan Siram Singh warned this country. The Chief Medical Officer warned this country. I warned the country. But there's a narrative that started with the Honorable Member for Separia, Kamla Pasad Bisesa, where over a year ago she accused the Chief Medical Officer and myself of hiding COVID data. You remember that? Now that is par for the course for a political leader. What was regrettable at the time was the pulling in of a public officer into the political guile. Unfortunately, unfortunately, another commentator in one of the newspapers yesterday continued to put words in the mouth of Dr. Avery Hines and the Chief Medical Officer, stating that they warned the government to lock down prior to Easter. Leave the public officers alone, please. They warned the population to behave. That is what they did. So if we are going to quote the public officers, either quote them correctly, based on science and fact. Now is not the time 12 months later to call the integrity of the chief medical officer and Dr. Hines into question. I could tell you, Dr. Hines nor the chief medical officer never recommended to either myself or any other party a lockdown as erroneously stated. The spokesperson went on to talk about gatherings in high political circles. You may remember I myself was here 
saying that every creed and race brought us to this point. And I mentioned the West, Wessels, down the islands. I mentioned the East, Zessas. I mentioned Tobago. Every creed and race has brought us to this. So it is so unfortunate that the messages are being twisted and misconstrued to serve a political narrative. The Minister of Health, and this is where my integrity is being called into question, I have always been honest with the public. I have given you good news, I have given you bad news. The first time we had a case, we came to you. The first time we had a variant, we came to you. We hit nothing. But that is par for the course. I just want to reiterate that as far as this continuing narrative about Easter, I want to quote the Honorable Prime Minister's warning and exhortations. At his March 27th press conference, the Prime Minister said, he expected the next few holiday days will be a days of relaxation. But the relaxation should not affect our response. We kept saying that, relax, yes. But don't let the relaxation affect our response. And he quotes, wherever you are, whatever you do, you are doing it in a pandemic. Please do not congregate. Is the heart of the nation beaten correctly today, as the Guardian says? Is the heart of the nation really beaten correctly today? When what we see, both the public officers and the political voices, are being conveniently misconstrued to serve a narrative. We are in this together, Trinidad and Tobago. We cannot ignore the warnings of Dr. Aura. He says his best. TT can lose the fight if citizens, if citizens do not play their part. All citizens. Citizens in the corridors of power. Citizens in any sphere of life. And my quotation, every creed and race, every commentator, if you have an opposing view, have it. But let it be based on science, fact, and truth. What we don't need now, as we fight this wave, is untruths and convenient narratives to suit a political agenda. So we have been constant consistent, truthful from the one. So Al, I want to thank you for the past few minutes and I urge Trinidad and Tobago to let us work together, recommend things to the government. We don't claim to have all the answers. And let the narrative and the opposing views be based on science, fact and truth and we will always listen thank you very much al and thank you minister we move now into our question and answer segment the media is reminded that representatives begin by stating their name and the name of the media house before you put forward your questions to the panelists please remember no more than two brief questions and if time permits, we will accommodate questions from each media house. We begin with CL Communications. Good morning, Natalie, Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. Um, I just was wondering, is the Brazilian variant responsible for the COVID-19 deaths among young people that we saw within the last few days? And then secondly, is the ministry looking to expand the current phase of um, vaccination to include young, young adults? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so we had included, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. to do some subtyping at the labs 
of persons that would have been having unusual presentations clinically at the hospitals. We have done so. Um, they correlate with the deaths. We need to get that information back from the UE labs. So we can probably, um, as we get that information, if there's any correlation, we will come back to you and let you know. But so far, I haven't been informed of such such. So as soon as we get any information in that regard, we'll let you all know. Um, Minister, you yeah, let me take the second question. Um, good question about the young people. You may remember, Ms. Singh, when we expanded the criteria for the second phase of the AstraZeneca vaccine, we did see persons under 50, which will be young persons with comorbidities, can be vaccinated. So yes, we did do it. And when we get in the Sinopharm vaccines, 100,000 doses, we will be going deeper into that population for young persons under 50 with NCDs, so asthma, diabetes, hypertension. And now I think we need to look at the issue, CMO. I'm putting you on the spot here now of obesity. Because, because we are noticing a lot of the, the recent deaths are for the overweight and the Correct, obese. Yeah. Yes, CMO. So, so obesity was included um, yeah. from our side as an N, not an NCD, but as a risk factor yeah. for COVID-19. So it certainly it can be. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And thank you for your question. We now move to AZP News. Hi, good morning. Priya Bihari, azpnews.com. My first question is for Minister Dial Singh. Minister Dial Singh, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Sinopharm vaccine. The, the clinical trials that have been done, it, um, um, it has been stated that there have not been enough, enough clinical trials to show that the vaccine is effective in people over 60 and over. And also, some people need a third shot because it shows that that the immunity response is low. So, so my question, therefore, is how do you know that your immunity response is low? And would we be using this vaccine for people over 60? And my second question, I want to talk, um, I don't know if Dr. Abdul Richards could talk about the parallel healthcare system. What happened, a lot of people are dying, as you said, at home, and people now are a bit cautious and a bit wary about going and get a test if they have any symptoms. And they are, they are a bit scared to go into the public health system and then into the parallel, parallel healthcare system. So my question is, therefore, what is your advice if someone is ill? Should you know people feel that they're better off fighting it at home rather than going into the public healthcare and the parallel healthcare system? Thank you. Okay, yeah, just to clear a point with the, so WHO has approved this vaccine, which is Sinopharm out of Beijing. As Minister would have indicated, there's another plant out of Wuhan. So the WHO has approved the Beijing, the manufacturing out of the Beijing plant, and they have approved, in terms of conditions of use, persons over 18, there's no upper limit, and I just stress there's no upper limit of use. So meaning 18 and above, just like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and the other vaccines. So there's no upper limit. What they noted is that there were less patients in the 60 and above in their phase 3 trial, which was a, tri a trial done in the UAE. Now, noting that this vaccine has been used in 45 countries, upwards of 60 million doses have already been given. That data will obviously come forth, and they have been using people over 60 um, throughout the world. My Drug Advisory Committee has met on it in terms of our national um, considerations, and our conditions are used mirror what WHO has mirrored, which is 18 years and above, including those over 60 years of age at this time. Um, let me let me just clarify again. Um, and prior, we all have a duty to be careful what we see in the public domain. I said at the press conference on Friday that China had three vaccines before WHO for trials. Two from Sinopharm from two plants, one in Beijing and one in Wuhan, and then the Sinovac. A lot of commentators are commingling the data from these three vaccines to suit a particular narrative. Let me be clear again. The vaccine that we are bringing in is a WHO approved emergency use authorization vaccine, Sinopharm Beijing. It is not Sinopharm Wuhan. It is not Sinovac.
people are conflating the data sheets from all three and exercising by jumping to conclusions. So I just wanted to put that on your record again. Thank you very much, my friend. Okay, and the question regarding advice for persons um, who are ill at home. Let Dr. Richards do that. Good morning, Mr. Bihari. Thank you very much for that question. I'd like to remind all members of the population, Trinidad and Tobago, that you need to exercise social responsibility. The parallel healthcare system has been formulated and has been resilient to protect you and contain the virus if you are positive from all aspects, be it from the quarantine centers, the step-down facilities, ward-level beds, ICU, HDU. It is staffed with specialists and persons who can take care of you from nurses and doctors and all other persons. So my advice to persons who believe that they are COVID positive would be to contact the Ministry of Health on 800-WELL, 877-WELL, and arrange to be tested. During that time between the onset of symptoms, please isolate yourself at home uh, and do not go to work. Commingling, mixing, congregating is the major risk factor. And you need to protect your relatives and your co-workers, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters. So let's please... Um, continue to practice, you know, avoiding mixing and commingling, which are the, the, one of the main risk factors in addition to mask wearing. And let's work with the Ministry of Health because we are in this together so that we can enter and be treated into the parallel healthcare system. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Richards. We quickly move to 98.1. And uh, a very good morning to you, Mr. Alexander, and uh, to the entire panel. Uh, Stephen Cummings, 98.1 FM. Uh, my two questions quickly uh, for uh, Minister Dial Singh. Uh, Minister uh, B, uh, it's being reported that some members of the police service have been complaining over a lack of proper vaccination protocols um, in ensuring that officers are given uh, frontline treatment, a measure which um, they claim to be more on the side of policy and uh, it may not uh, be that of the so much of the police administration. Um, one member of the TTPS Social Welfare Association claimed that officers have been made to stand in line at vaccination centers um, like average citizens, posing an extra risk knowing that they are frontline. Is there a policy position to which you can, uh, you know, you, Minister, can speak to or help address in that regard? Also, um, one member of the opposition um, has also accused the government, and uh, more so directly um, you, Minister, of uh, signing a non-disclosure agreement with the Chinese government, even before th there was WHO approval um, being given uh, to the Sinopharm um, glass vials. Um, are you also able to address, um, you know, address this in, 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 in any way? Um, because you have, um, I mean, even, even in your opening, um, you spent quite some time on, on responding to opposition claims. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the issue of the police, you may recall, <laughs> and we will say it again, we made 3,000 doses available to the Ministry of National Security for them to administer using their medical personnel. You would have seen the Commissioner of Police, the then Minister of National Security being vaccinated on a Saturday morning to kick that off. So our policy was to make 3,000 doses available to the Ministry of National Security using their medical personnel within the TTPS and the Defence Force to specifically vaccinate their personnel. So I hope that answers that. A non-disclosure agreement is a normal negotiating process and I have said you have singled out Sinopharm. I have said publicly we also signed NDA's um, CMO, can you remember which one? Uh, with Pfizer. What a non-disclosure agreement does with Pfizer and Sinopharm. It is a mechanism to have negotiations where we cannot disclose the following. The formula of the vaccine, because they guard their intellectual property jealously. 
we cannot disclose patent issues, we cannot disclose pricing, and we cannot disclose quantities until we have a commercial agreement and then pricing quantities will be made public. So we have signed non-disclosure agreements, as I have said publicly, with both Sinopharm and Pfizer, is it? Yeah. Pfizer. So it's not that we signed with one alone. It is still the narrative of the opposition to derail this country's vaccination program, and I thank you for raising it so we can clear it up in all transparency. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we quickly go to Guardian Media. Hi, morning everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my first question is to Dr. Hines. Um, within this two-week period and the projections that you've shown us just now, because we have about two weeks again until the, um, the period of restriction comes to an end and we will probably uh, renew or extend or whatever, right? How realistic of an uh, impact can we expect to really see from these measures given your projections and what level of decrease would it be um, would be the barometer for you all saying that it's an, uh, 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 a positive impact that we are seeing we are, we're heading in a right in the, in the right place and my second question is to dr. Miriam Richards um, so you mentioned a bit about expanding um, some spaces and adding a new category of um, care for, for um, COVID-19 patients but how long could these additional spaces um, really postpone this collapse that you spoke about last week and over the weekend and what contingencies are being made to not only increase the bed spaces within these institutions in the parallel healthcare system but also increase the staffing because you yourself have said that it's not only about bed spaces it's about the staff to also treat a patient and from what I've been hearing within the parallel healthcare system is that the staff is overwhelmed and at some time they may be even short staff. Thank you very much. Dr. Hines? Okay. Uh, in tackling your first question, first of all, I'd like to point out that the success of the measures, the likelihood that the measures will yield the decrease that we are looking for and hoping for, really depends to some extent on how avidly the population follows the regulations and abides by the restrictions. Now, one of the things that we do notice is that when restrictions are put into place, there's always groups of individuals looking at being exempt from these uh, these restrictions, being the exceptions to the rule, trying to find ways to beat the system, so to speak. But this system is being implemented to beat COVID. So if you're trying to beat the system, then you're working along with the virus. So the extent to which we cooperate with the system will impact on the extent to which those measures are successful. We are at the maybe 10 days or so out from the uh, the more stringent of the of the restrictions implemented and we're hoping that we begin to see that uh, deviation from the projected upward trend that indicates that we are having some effect. As the few uh, next few days roll out, we'll be in a better position to see whether we're beginning to see that or not. But the point at which we can say, okay, yes, these are now successful. That depends on a number of things. Number one, on downward trends being maintained and also on what's happening in the rest of the population with respect to percentages of positivity, uh, with respect to the systems being less and less overwhelmed. All of that is going to be taken into account uh, at its various levels, at the various levels of importance before we can say yes or no, we are achieving success and we're going to have to keep updating the population with the information as we make each new assessment and that's what we will, that's what we will continue to do. So we won't claim success before we get some, uh, some clear sustained trends in the correct direction but we don't have a specific cut off level for the simple reason that uh, that's not how these decisions are made. It's not a random cut off but it is a, a consideration of a wide range of factors. So I hope that clarifies a little bit. I'm going to turn you over to Al. 
And thank you very much. And we go straight to Dr. Richards to treat with the second question. Thank you very much, Richard, for that question. Um, what I'd like to just stress to the members of the population would be that we have added 110 ward level beds, which are the critical beds that are required for um, you know, the rate limiting factor, which would be the persons who are quite ill and can't go home um, as yet. So we've added those 110 beds, but we have recognized human resources as a limiting factor. What we've been doing is redeploying human resources throughout all the RHA systems and across the board. Uh, this graph, just to demonstrate to you, Richard, shows that the gap between the number of admissions and discharges is narrowing. And this gap is really due to the increasing number of beds. We are hoping that this gap narrows, but even with um, a rolling average of close to 300 and you know 15 additional persons per 100 as of this morning, we are still testing the parallel healthcare system. If we continue at this trend, we still have about seven days to go. So we are asking everyone to cut back on the supply of or the demand for beds uh, because we do have a limited supply and let's practice our COVID-19 mitigation measures. Thank you very much for that question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for today's media conference. We really do appreciate that you make the time to view these conferences every week. Remember, we are all in this together. We urge everyone to do their part to safeguard the health of our nation. Be safe and enjoy the rest of your day. And please remember the, w, the, the, the three W's. Wash your hands, watch your distance, and of course, wear your mask. Goodbye for now. This is TTT. Live for local.